How many times have you needed to grasp a new technology quickly? Don't you wish you could have one of the industry leading experts available to answer your questions? And wouldn't it be nice if you had a resource that you could rely on at all hours of the day or night to quickly find the topics you need information on? And perhaps you'd like short tutorials to get you over a configuration hump or a way to find answers to frequently asked questions. And they have to be a little bit better than those, uh, how do I plug it into the wall type FAQs found on most manufacturers' websites. And most importantly, wouldn't it be nice if you could listen to a familiar and trusted voice in our industry? You know, somebody who's brand agnostic and who can give it to you straight without just trying to get you to buy some new product. So well, let's do, do yeah, let's do it. <laughs> I'm Neil Weber. And I'm Clay Stalka. And that's exactly, Neil, what we're trying to bring each and every time that we get together here with each one of you. A real and clearly focused look at the technologies we're all faced with. Now, today, we have a very special guest joining us. Jonathan Braun from Braun Consulting is here to help us get our heads around the video over IP concept. Now, I bet most of you are already familiar with Braun Consulting. Yeah, perhaps you've read an article or taken a class from them. Maybe you've heard them speak at Infocom. I know I have. Whatever the case, these are the folks that help turn the rudder in the A, IT, and digital signage industries across the AV world. Now, they work with manufacturers, they work with standard committees, they do trade organizations, and they all tie things together. You know, it makes it all work, and it wouldn't be without them. So over these many years, they've done a terrific job. So we're proud to have them. Jonathan, baby, welcome to our little coffee break. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that, Neil and Clay. Thanks for having me on today. Of course. Hey, can you take just a minute and tell our viewers a little bit about your background and uh, the history of Braun Consulting? Absolutely. So uh, I have to give a little thanks to my father in this regard. Uh, my father, Alan, he's been around the industry for 35 plus years. And I joke he didn't believe in child labor laws when I was kind of about 12. He asked me to help him start building PowerPoints. And jokes aside, it was a great opportunity. I knew how to do PowerPoint and computer -y type stuff. He didn't have the time or the inclination to learn it when he was at Hughes Aircraft and Hughes JVC with their projector division. So he asked me to get involved and help him build presentations and things. It gave me great exposure to the industry. And over the years, I've gotten to participate in training at Infocom. I've gotten to work alongside him at his various stops in his great career. And that gave me the opportunity to join Braun Consulting and we've become a, a, an evolution where we started as an educational company. My dad's known as a, as a teacher in the industry. People joke about him as the professor. But we started as an educational company, and today we're an outsourced services company. But our passion still lies in education and doing things like this, which is personally one of the reasons I'm, I'm really glad to be here today and have this conversation with everyone. So uh, we've got a whole bunch of different manufacturers that we work with, as you outlined, but our, our real passion lies in our teaching with Infocom and standards development and working with groups like the Digital Science Federation and that uh, in the industry. So that's kind of us in a nutshell. Uh, there's a lot more I could go on to, but I won't bore everybody with the details today because I'd take up our whole discussion with that. <laughs> that's all right. Well, that's awesome, Jonathan. Thank you so much. So we'd like to have you tell us your thoughts on why we would choose video over IP. So that's a real exciting topic these days, and I was really looking forward to this discussion today because of that. Now, video over IP can kind of fall into a couple of different benefits. Uh, first, it can be used as a cost savings measure. Now, people who've priced video over IP in the earlier days would probably go, hey, isn't this kind of expensive? But consider this. Using this type of technology lets us send one source to many displays, regardless of distance. And we can, yes, do that with things like Cat5 Balens or HD Base T, but it's a simpler infrastructure because, in many cases, it already exists. We're leveraging an existing IP network. So, this means we can avoid dedicated cable poles, maybe. It depends. I'm sure we'll talk more about that later because there's some it depends to this. But that makes it typically easier to install. So that also could lead to it being a time-saving measure for the same reasons. We're leveraging that existing on-site network that uses standard IT infrastructure. 
So this gives us some really good potential benefits to AV over IP, but that's one of the big reasons I think people would use it. So Jonathan, how can we better understand the standards that we use for sending video over IP? Okay, so that's a really, really great question there, Clay, because standards are one of the biggest challenges in AV over IP in general, but video over IP in specific. And we have to talk about a couple of different things like video compression standards and that. So there are three main issues that we need to consider when we're discussing standards in general for video over IP. We have to talk about physical format, we have to talk about the transmission standard, and we have to talk about compression. Okay, so physical format, that's the type of connections that are required. This could be standard gigabit Ethernet for 1080p and upwards of 40 gigabit copper or fiber Ethernet for 4K, depending on the standards that are used for transmission and the compression, right? So when we go from there, we have to talk about transmission standards. So that's going to refer to the manufacture of the IP's encoder-decoder system. Are they using proprietary pro protocols or universal standards? So if universal, what standards are supported? Universal systems can actually be more flexible since they interoperate with any manufacturer's equipment. But proprietary systems can often be optimized beyond what the standards may support. Now this can be both a benefit and a challenge depending on how you look at it. Mm -hmm. And then compression, that's a huge, huge issue. Uh, for those unfamiliar with the topic, which is a whole different discussion and probably a much lengthier webinar into and of itself, I'll spare everybody the technical geeky details, uh, we're referring to compressing the video down into a smaller amount of data to reduce the bandwidth used by the IP stream. Now we've been using different standards for video compression in video files for years. And things like H.264 and JPEG-based compression are commonplace for 1080p video. Now there are a number of newer standards developing now like H.265 and similar, but there are also proprietary compression algorithms coming out now that enable even better utilization of bandwidth. This also directly relates to the quality of the image. Good, good way of putting it. Now speaking of compression, can you tell us how that actually impacts the image quality at the end of the day? Well, I'm glad you asked that question, Clay, because anytime we compress the video, we're potentially reducing quality. Now, I know there's lots of the term lossless being thrown out there, which means compression without any loss of, of data or loss of, of quality, but all of this highly depends on the type of compression and the amount of compression. The big issue here we have to ask ourselves is, is the loss of compression visible to the viewer? Now, if we add a ton of compression, this will reduce the quality, but it makes the data stream smaller. Now, that's going to show itself as pixelation, blocking, or blurriness in the video. And this is something, if you've gotten into satellite, uh, especially companies, well, I won't name names because I don't want to throw anybody under the bus because they do a great job, but very popular satellite and cable providers have done this for years. And it does show in some cases, okay, where you'll see that blocking when there's fast motion or you'll see a noticeable blurriness or you'll see noise in the image that you probably don't expect to really be there. Uh, also, we have to mess around with frame rate in here as well. The fewer frames per second, plus compression equals a smaller stream. So that can be a benefit in compression, but fewer frames per second can mean, well, if we're reducing the frames per second, we're making the motion more jittery. So while that equals a smaller stream, that may not necessarily be ideal. Mm -hmm. So now that you're talking about this stream size thing, what are the real bandwidth requirements for video over IP? So that's an, a, an interesting question and a tough question because the answer is it depends, like a lot of things in AV, right? And what does it depend on? So it depends on resolution, it depends on frame rate, and it depends on your level of compression. So we've got some great examples that you guys put up on the screen there to share, and that works really well. But let's take an example that many of our viewers today are going to be familiar with. So let's talk about Netflix. What do they say you need? Now, a bunch of people are probably going, oh man, how does this relate? And just hang in there a second. So if you ask Netflix, you need 5 megabits per second for 1080p and 25 megabits per second for 4K UHD. And a bunch of people are going, huh? That doesn't make a lot of sense. Well, that's the thing. 
they're compressing very heavily and their services are optimized to run over the internet. Gotcha. So with local LAN and Wi-Fi based streaming, we generally have more bandwidth, right? So inside your network, you have much more bandwidth. And they're much more sensitive to things like buffering and latency because the players typically aren't designed the same way for something like Netflix. And frankly, it's not such a big deal if you're in the middle of kind of binge watching your favorite show on Netflix and all of a sudden you get the little spinny logo of, oh, I need to get more data. It's not the end of the world. But for our commercial applications, that's a bit challenging. So all the numbers here will be higher. Like, for example, using 1080p60 and an H.264 compression, your average commercial AV grade encoder will need about 25 megabits for just that stream. Now think about that. That's five times higher than Netflix claims you need for 1080p. But the quality will be much better. Gotcha. First, I'd like to say I like the fact that Netflix has kind of taken the stigma away from binge doing anything and suddenly made it a good thing. <laughs> binge, nice. binge watching isn't so bad suddenly. But hey, while we're... While we take a minute to have everybody digest all of that information, Jonathan, I'm going to bring up an important announcement about the newest addition to the Barco ClickShare family. So this is the newly announced Barco ClickShare CSE 800. It builds on the wildly successful ClickShare family of products and gives us a hardware platform that now fits right into the higher end boardroom and conference space. So the CSE 800 still offers the benchmark for secure wireless screen sharing, and it now offers displaying up to eight users on screen simultaneously. It also adds blackboarding and annotation and built-in moderation functionality, which is really cool. Plus, it has vid built-in video switching and two HDMI inputs, so external video sources can be dis displayed on screen as well. And the two HDMI video outputs support dual display configurations. So imagine you could have participant screen sharing on one display while external video content is shown on the second display simultaneously, which is really awesome. And both output support full 4K 4096 by 2160 resolution. So now the new Barco CSE 800 will begin shipping in Q2 this spring. So for your upcoming projects beginning in May or so, please keep that new CSE 800 in mind moving forward. Yeah, and if that sounds like a product that, you, that you've all been waiting for, and it, I know it is for us, it'll be in stock and stare in, in a couple months. So let's get back with Jonathan Braun from Braun Consulting. Now, Jonathan, as we were introducing folks to the new Barco ClickShare CSE 800, I was thinking in my mind of how what you've shared with us all fits together into the overall network topology. So can you elaborate, elaborate a little bit for us on that? Uh, I'd be glad to, Clay, absolutely, although I'm kind of sitting here thinking, hey, wait, that new ClickShare sounds pretty awesome. I kind of want one of those from my <laughs> office, too. So I may have to talk to you guys about that later. Uh, All right. So if I'm planning a, a video over IP implementation, what I have to think about, what I need to ensure I understand, first and foremost is the amount of bandwidth I'll need. And the thing I want everyone to keep in mind is understand you need overhead just in case. Nobody wants to deal with riding the absolute limit of the amount of resources we have. That's asking for trouble. Mm -hmm. And we need to work with the IT department at the end user's location to evaluate the impact this is going to have on their network. Because we are going to use a considerable amount of bandwidth, at least in IT terms. So we have to determine first, will that video stream, one, be able to work on their existing network infrastructure? Do they have enough bandwidth for us? But two, will it be able to coexist without completely saturating the available bandwidth in the network? Because at the end of the day, think about everything the IT infrastructure in every single one of our lives represents. And in our business, there's other critical business functions that we don't want it to ever potentially harm by implementing something new, right? Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, we're going to have to look at isolating our equipment. Now that may be something that's implemented within the customer's existing network by just kind of rejiggering around switches and creating maybe a virtual network of its own but that is completely set aside or uh, maybe we even have to build our own network. Okay, and That's a concept I'll cover again in just one second. Uh, we also need to ensure that their network will support multicast along the way 
because multicast is critical for AV over IP in general, but video over IP in specific, it means we can conserve bandwidth by replicating the stream through the switches to let the source not have to send out one for one stream for every single receiver. That's a major, major issue. Right. Uh, also, we got to ask: Will the stream be covering just a single site? Now, this brings us back to something that our digital signage application brings to mind, the concept of BYON, bring your own network. Now, this is kind of a new concept for a lot of people, but consider, if we establish our own isolated infrastructure, it allows the system to be managed properly, and we make the on-site IT staff happy, which means we get to be happy. Okay. And then we also need to consider the reliability of the network, the uptime of the network. Uh, we really can't afford to have the stream stutter or drop. Okay? Right. Remember, I may have cracked wise about Netflix and buffering. That's fine if you're watching something at home or if you're on YouTube or whatever. But I'm sorry, if we're using an IP stream for video inside, let's say it's the CEO's address to a company and we're streaming it out to all the displays in a facility so everybody can watch and listen in, if it stutters, that's unacceptable. Okay? The other thing that a lot of people don't consider is latency of the network. That needs a thought or two here. How much delay are we introducing by the process that we have? Because we're encoding the video sending it over the network, it may go through multiple points on that network, and then be decoded. Will that impact the viewers at all? Don't immediately say no, because it might, and how much will that impact viewers? It's kind of like a lip sync error in video when you're watching a movie at home. If it's just off enough, it'll kind of make you a little twitchy, because you won't quite be able to put your finger on exactly what's wrong, but you'll know something's wrong, right? Right. Now, that latency can be tweaked, right? Yeah, it depends on the equipment. That's a, a really good question. Um, it depends on the equipment. We need to think about how much is automatically introduced by the encoding-decoding process, and then how much latency the network itself introduces. And that may end up with things you can't affect. It may end up with things you can. Gotcha. So in the few minutes that we have left here today, Jonathan, I'd like to just ask you, and first of all, say thank you so much. That's such valuable information. I'm sure we all wish that we had another hour or whatever to go on and learn more about it, but at least it wets our whistle for what we need to think about when we're doing uh, video I, I, over IP uh, planning for the future. So is there any parting shots that you want to leave with us or any, any uh, pieces of wisdom that you have? Well, I won't necessarily call it wisdom, but I'll definitely share my opinion with you guys. You know, the reality is, and, and I hope everyone in the audience takes this to heart, that the, the future really is AV over IP. And while it may seem complicated today, and it may seem somewhat expensive, if you take a bigger picture approach to it, no pun intended, you'll find that this kind of technology, when deployed correctly, can be much simpler than you think, it can be much more cost effective than you think because you have to think more than the cost of the box, right? And it can give you serious benefits. So if you're not considering it now, I figure if you're attending, you probably are, but if you're not considering it now, hopefully this kind of opens up your thinking to it. And if you are using it now, know that it's only going to continue to improve. And I think that ultimately makes the job of any AV person, whether it's a reseller or an end user, easier. So this really is the future. Great. So Jonathan, one last thing uh, that I want to ask you about. You know, it's Friday. Um, I would like to hear your thoughts on uh, a recommendation for a good uh, IPA. Oh, that's a different kind of, of AV over IP there, huh? <laughs> that's right. Well, okay, that's so, right. So, so you got me craft beer is a hobby of mine, and being here in San Diego, uh, one you can get anywhere in the country, uh, Ballast Point Sculpin. Uh, it's not my absolute favorite, but it's one I know you can find almost anywhere. It would be an excellent IPA to enjoy on a Friday afternoon. There we go. Thank you, Jonathan. Hey, seriously, your insight into video over IP has been most, most helpful, and I'm sure I speak for the entire audience when I tell you that this is exactly what we all need as we move forward into this new frontier of video over IP distribution. So, Neil, it's time to give away a $50 gift card for one of our lucky partners here uh, who's joined us in this uh, session. You know, Clay, I think 
winter gets a bad rap. I mean, check local listings, of course. Jonathan doesn't know the meaning of the word winter, but, you know, there's winter storm warning. There's uh, endless winter. There's old man winter. Well, you know, I'm going to put a positive spin on winter because our winner is Jim Winter from New York. Congratulations. Yeah, way to go, Jim. So <laughs> please... Please tell all your friends and co-workers to join us in two weeks at the same time because we'd really love to have you be our next $50 gift card winner. That's true, and if you'd like, I could stitch that long preamble I did about winter onto a nice pillow for you, Jim. <laughs> the, congratulations, and, and thanks to everybody for giving us your 20 minutes today to learn more about distributing video over IP. And seriously, having you take part in a session like this one help all of us grow our community of well-informed AV pro professionals and with this kind of community here and through our new Synergy Center that we discussed last week we all can grow together as we improve our industry and the services that we all provide to our customers. So please join us again on Friday February the 24th for our next AV Meetup Coffee Break and there we're going to look at uh, point source versus line array loudspeaker systems something you'd all like to uh, take part in I'm sure. And please remember you can go to our website anytime to watch all of our AV Meetup sessions on demand. That's right. So for more information, to set up a demo, or to dive deeper into any of our products with a personalized online workshop, please contact your Starin Business Development Manager directly, or you can always email us here at my team at starin.biz. And if you ever need any application assistance on video over IP opportunities, I'd personally love to have you call me directly, and we'll find a solution that fits just perfectly for you. Our time's up, but we do promise to address your questions and interests directly. And it might even be Clay who calls or emails you with your answer. And we might even throw out another recommendation for a great craft beer from our friend Jonathan here. So uh, the reason I'm laughing is that uh, somebody wants Clay for you to do your best Casey Kasem and remind us to keep Keep reaching for the stars. Yeah. <laughs> oh, great. Well, we'll see you again on Friday, February 24th. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Hey, thanks again for joining us. Everybody have a great weekend. Bye-bye. Take care, everyone. <laughs>